Welcome back. It's lovely to have had so many colleagues and friends and supporters here for David's uh, Sanders lectures this year, um, one, two, and now our third night. Uh, my name is Dr Jessica Gardner and I'm the University Librarian for Cambridge. If I haven't had a chance to say hello to you yet, please do. Uh, let's make sure we do that during the evening. I'm delighted to welcome you back for the third and final Sanders Lecture for 2022-23, given of course by Dr David Pearson. David's first two lectures have told the compelling story of Cambridge bookbindings across more than three centuries. And like his publications, which have become key references and works that are found in reading room walls and on bookshelves around the world, and his recent development of the freely available database Book Owners Online, these lectures are a testament to David's commitment to sharing his knowledge as widely as possible. And I think we'd all agree in ways that are accessible to the specialist and also to the non-specialist audience. Tonight, his final lecture, David will turn his attention to the people behind the books, the bookbinders and customers. There will be an opportunity to ask David questions after his talk. And if you're joining us on the live stream, you can submit your questions at any time uh, on the Zoom chat or in the Q&A. For now, please help me join and welcome David for his third Sanders lecture. Thank you again, Jessica, for the kind words. And again, thank you to all of you, both here and wherever you are um, in the world watching this, um, for, for coming again. My first two lectures were largely built around a narrative of the stylistic evolution of Cambridge bookbinding between the mid-15th and the late 18th centuries. And having completed that, I'd like to turn in my last lecture to the binders and uh, to their trade networks and to their customers and to some questions about the methodology and the rationale for looking at historic bindings. The bookbinding trade in Cambridge was sustained by successive generations of skilled professionals who were trained at the beginnings of their careers in the techniques involved. Teenage boys, usually, were apprenticed to established tradesmen and after seven years or thereabouts they were freed and entitled to hire out their services or progress to setting up their own businesses. There was no structure of trade guilds in Cambridge like the London Livery Companies, to which they had to belong, but anyone practising in any branch of the book trade here in Cambridge was required from 1502 onwards to register with the university as a privileged person. That meant that they effectively became a member of the university with certain rights um, and privileges and also obligations. It's a great boon to historians of the book trade that it did work like that, as the various lists and records of privileged persons and the fact that such people had their wills proved in university courts has made them easier to document than, than would be the case for early tradespeople more generally. Bookbinding was an integral part of a wider web of interconnected trades which facilitated the production and the distribution of books. Printers turned an authorial manuscript into loose sheets of paper carrying the text in a legible and ordered form and binders took those sheets and turned them into usable books that booksellers could then sell to customers. Those stages were interconnected in variable and fluid ways and there's no single model which dictates the way in which it always happened. All the evidence suggests that binders were essentially independent businessmen. They weren't permanent employees of printers or booksellers, but there were regular and ongoing relationships between booksellers and binders. It used to be received wisdom that books were only bound in the early modern period when a customer decided to buy a copy, but we do now recognise that it was a much more hybrid economy than that, and many books were bound in advance of anticipated sale. Anyone spending their working career binding books and nothing else, turning the loose sheets into sewn and decorated bindings, was unlikely to end up rich. Binding was always at the bottom of the book trade hierarchy, financially and socially. 
when John Field, the Cambridge University printer, died in 1668, his household goods and stock were valued at nearly £1,800, and he was able to leave his two children £1,000 each. Twelve years later, Anthony Nicholson, who seems to have been in business in Cambridge only as a bookbinder, died, leaving effects valued at £2, 12 shillings and eightpence. The way to succeed as a binder was to diversify your activities, to start selling books as well as binding them, and perhaps taking on other jobs as well. One of the reasons why we know so few binders' names, why we have to resort to nicknames like the Unicorn Binder and the Demon Binder, is that their lowly social status meant that they were too rarely acknowledged by name in the documentary footprint. Anyone who has spent any time looking for records of binding work in archival sources will know how often the line reads, paid the binder, or paid for binding, for binding three folios, for binding, etc., rather than paid Daniel Boyce or paid John Holden, or whatever. Many of the people whose names we do know or regularly quote as Cambridge binders, Garrett Godfrey, John Shears, Thomas Dawson, were actually running businesses, selling books and stationery, and that's how they became affluent. Some binders might have more modest operations with stalls selling new or second-hand books. They often made end ends meet by doing other work altogether. Numerous 16th century binders in Cambridge and also in Oxford were also <coughs> vintners, wine sellers. And Cambridge binders often held university administrative positions as, be as bedels or as keepers of the schools, the janitors who looked after the running of the building that we now know as the old schools just behind the Senate House. When Henry Moody died in 1637, he was described in the parish register not as a bookbinder, which is how we think about him generally, but as Henry Moody the schoolkeeper. He was essentially the janitor of the old schools. And that job was then taken over by John Holden, who effectively succeeded him as the leading, uh, the, the go-to binder in Cambridge in the middle of the 17th century. This range of activity, combined with the fact that there's no one pattern that fits all, is one reason why early terminology is very fluid. And you'll find the same people interchangeably described in archival sources as bookbinders, booksellers, or stationers. Defining just what we mean by a bookbinder in the early modern context, therefore, does need more consideration than you might think. But by trying to pull together everyone in Cambridge for whom we have a record of binding books between the mid-15th and the late 18th century, I ended up with a list of 102 names. In some cases, we know next to nothing about them, apart from some dates, and in other cases, we know rather more. And I've tried to summarise the available information in a biographical directory, which is one of the appendices in my book. Some of these people have been well documented for a long time because the university probate records, which include book, tra book trade personnel because they were privileged persons, were opened up as long ago as 1915 by Gray and Palmer and their edited versions of these wills and inventories remains a very valuable source. More recently, two important new quarries of information have come on stream to help us to expand our knowledge the genealogical databases, and the detailed cataloguing of the university court records. Ancestry and Find My Past as have, as I'm sure you know, ingested vast quantities of biographical data, and although they may often yield back no more than a few snippets of information, some refinements to, uh, to dates or extensions, they will often provide a little bit to help you to fill out the picture. The great riches of the records of the university courts, detailing the minutiae of the disputes and grievances of ordinary Cambridge people in centuries gone by, were described by Jackie Cox in the Cambridge Bibsock transactions a few years ago. Uh, 
The cataloguing of these records on a case-by-case -case and exhibit-by-exhibit -exhibit basis is an ongoing project which has already opened up a great deal of information on 16th and 17th century Cambridge tradesmen of all kinds. Parish registers give us dry facts when people were born or married or died. Um, probate records give us fuller insights into the kinds of households which people maintained, some sense of their level of affluence or otherwise, particularly if there are inventories as well as wills. The court records, which are largely concerned with discipline and the resolution of cases around defamation, injury or debt, offer us little glimpses into real life. A master binder complaining about an absconding apprentice who cut the seal off his, off his indenture document. An allegation that William Jackson, a bookbinder, slandered a fellow of Trinity College by calling him a scurvy jack. <laughs> to which Jackson responded that Trinity College was full of arrant thieves, as bad as would be found anywhere in England. And I have passed no comment on that. Um, around the same time, in the, in the 1590s, one binder, John Jones, accused another, John Bartholomew, of beating and striking him with a pair of tongs upon the head and divers other parts of the body, causing grievous injury. Bartholomew was clearly not popular. He came from Germany and had been accused a few years earlier of trading in Cambridge without proper authority. Perhaps there is a hint here of that love of immigrants from across the Channel uh, for which we have long been celebrated. Um, it is noticeable uh, that it is around the end of the 16th and going into the 17th centuries that the Cambridge binding trade becomes much more dominated by local Cambridge homegrown talent than was the case through much of the century before. In common with the English book trade more widely, its development in Cambridge relied extensively on the importation of skills by North European natives who settled here during the early Tudor period. And this applies to so many names in the directory of 16th century Cambridge binders. Peter Brainans, Garrett Godfrey, Nicholas Spearing, Sega Nicholson, Nicholas Pilgrim, Peter Shears, John Dennis, they all came from Northern Europe. A hundred years later, many of the people who fill the biographical directory of binders in Cambridge uh, were born here, where they seem to have spent their whole lives. Henry Moody, Daniel Boyce, Anthony Nicholson, Troilus Atkinson, Thomas Dawson. It's observably the case that the binding trade here was largely sustained through dynasties who succeeded from father to son through many decades, and there were multiple generations of Scarlets, Moody's, Boyce's, Pindar's, Dawson's and Nicholson's. All businesses were continued by former apprentices who became family members through marriage. But binders who'd originally trained in London sometimes came to Cambridge, and there were regular trade channels with the capital, both directly and via the great coming together of Stourbridge Fair just outside Cambridge, uh, which, as I'm sure you know, was the, the, the largest medieval, post-medieval fair, trading fair in England for a long time. So there was plenty of cross-fertilisation going on. People working on book trade history have increasingly been, been seeking to rectify the gender imbalance, which is inevitably variant, evident in documentary sources, as businesses were usually run and owned by men. But most images of early binderies do include women, uh, and we know that they regularly comprised permanent members of those teams, often as sewers or folders. However, as we never have employee lists, we don't know their names, though we can guess that many of them would be wives or daughters of some of the men who are in the pictures. The earliest female apprentice recorded at the Stationers' Company in London was bound in 1666, but I haven't found any girls taken on as binding apprentices here in Cambridge. Businesses could be taken over by widows and run for a while by them after their husband's deaths, sometimes, though, only until they remarried. John Shears died in 1581, and his widow Anne married Thomas Thomas, who became the printer, soon afterwards. 
Thomas thus inherited and carried on the Shears business, but there's no record of Anne as some kind of interim manager, as far as I'm aware. The only instance I've come across in Cambridge of this continuation of a business in a widow's name is that of Charity Richardson, who built the university library for binding work in 1721, the year that her husband John died after being in business here in the first two decades of the century. But that doesn't seem to have been carried on after that, and there seems to have been little or no tradition of that kind of pattern here in Cambridge. One of the avenues that I've tried to explore as part of this research project is the question of the wider trade networks within which these people operated. Bookbinders relied not only upon printers and booksellers to give them books to sell, uh, but also on a regular supply of other materials or manufactured objects like leather, parchment, thread, boards, clasps, tools, gold leaf, glue, recycled waste. Sadly, trying to find documentary evidence of those trade networks does prove to be like looking for hen's teeth. I have made various forays in the past to try to find more out about the design and manufacture of bookbinders' tools before pattern sheets began to be issued by toolmakers in the 19th century. As I've mentioned in earlier lectures, there are points in time when the simultaneous circulation of use of multiple very similar binding tools in Cambridge does suggest some local manufacture going on. But, as I say, I've found no, no record to help to, to lift the stone on that. When Cambridge bindings regularly incorporated clasps until the middle of the 16th century, I think we can assume that local blacksmiths will have produced them. One particular trade interface which must have been very regular and substantial is that between binders and leather sellers. Cambridge binders worked through an awful lot of tanned calfskin, not to mention other leathers, and also parchment, and there must have been a steady supply chain. When Henry Moody died in 1637, he left 360 calfskins in his shop, according to his probate inventory, indicating that he kept significant stocks on hand ready to use. But can I find a single archival source reflecting this trade? No. I'm guessing that some of the more exotic leathers used in Cambridge would have been sourced from further afield, but there were plenty of cows and butchers and tanners here, um, here and it seems likely that at least some of the leather that's now on Cambridge bookshelves uh, was once upon a time walking around the Cambridge field. <laughs> Most towns of any size through the early modern period, particularly those with rivers, maintained local tanning industries. And there have been studies and reconstructions of how they operated, although there isn't one, as far as I know, of, of early tanning work here in Cambridge. We know, though, that Cambridge did have tanneries. There used to be a tannery um, uh, by the river in that bit of land that's now between the back of Magdalen and St John's. And there are references to the regulation of the leather trade here in the town archives. The will and probate inventory of a tanner who died in Cambridge in 1610, Anthony Cadge, shows that he was a man of some substance at the time of his death with an estate valued at over £300. So skins from Cadge's operation may well have ended up in Moody's workshop um, and on Moody's bindings. But if this is a trade which ever had anything written down, it can't be found today. Bookbinders' accounts and day books sometimes survive in fragmentary form when they were recycled to use as binding waste, and they are valued and quarried when we find them, but I've only ever seen such things listing books sold to customers, not trade across binders' supply networks in that kind of way. Who bought all these books that were churned out by Cambridge bookbinders? In my chapter on customers, I divided it up between academics, students, institutions and Cambridge the town, all of whom played a part in keeping binders busy. There are many libraries assembled by Cambridge dons throughout their working careers which have been kept more or less together. 
which show how extensively they relied on locally made books and which at the same time proved to be very useful concentrations of Cambridge bindings of their period. The books of Edmund Jest in Salisbury Cathedral Library are a great, great quarry for mid-16th century Cambridge binding work, just as Andrew Perns at Peterhouse are full of late 16th century Cambridge centrepieces. For late 17th century Cambridge bindings, go, for example, to Humphrey Gower's or Peter Gunning's libraries at St John's or John Lawton's at Trinity. And for early 18th century ones, the books of Ralph Perkins at Queen's are, are something of a gold mine. Students constituted a much bigger and ever-changing body of customers, and they should all have needed books to support their studies. They were, of course, a very mixed bag, economically and socially, between the fellow commoners from wealthy or aristocratic families who might be using the university as a finishing school without graduating, the sizers who often had to pay for their education by being those people's servants, and everyone in between. Elizabeth Leedham Green's edition of the Cambridge Probate Inventories show that 16th century undergraduates who died before having, taking a degree sometimes had several dozen books with them, and there are countless Cambridge bindings whose end leaves reveal that they passed through student hands. Uh, we've probably all seen those kinds of examples of uh, books that were circulating around a group of students who all knew each other and left comradely or jokey messages behind. My observation, and it's a more anecdotal one than one that's the, the result of systematic research, <coughs> is that such inscriptions often look at first glance to be contemporary with the book, but when you look more closely they often turn out to be a little later. This 1664 Cambridge Homer was bound here around that time and it was given by one Trinity College student to another in 1692 but the donor can't have been the book's first owner, the dates don't work. I suspect therefore that a lot of student purchasing relied on a second hand trade or more informal passing around, but more investigation would be needed in a more planned way to explore that properly. There are lots of Cambridge bindings in the university library and the college libraries, and we might think that they would have contributed the largest share of binders' employment. But we have to remember that until quite late on, often not until the 18th century, most of them had no regular acquisition funds and they had to rely on donations for building their collections. Certainly binding work for new books was sometimes commissioned, but a lot of rebinding was undertaken of older books which were felt to be in need of repair. A lot of Pindar's work for the university library fell into that category. In the 1630s, Anthony Nicholson was given work there for binding up the old manuscripts in the library. Large donations sometimes catalyzed some binding or repair work, like William Branthwaite's at Keyes, when Pindar the Stationer, the earliest member of the Pindar dynasty that I know of, was paid in 1619 for new binding certain loose books. The great majority of any binding work done for libraries was of standard blind tooled calfskin kind of quality, nothing fancy unless there was a reason to the contrary linked with the donor or the purpose. We saw in the last lecture that a little better than basic was expended on many of the copies of Abraham Wellock's bead that were given to the college libraries and at Queen's in, 16, in 1700 Six shillings were spent for binding Horace Large. That's the Horace from the newly reinvigorated Cambridge Press. And Thomas Dawson returned it to them, looking like this. Thirty years later, uh, earlier, he was given two pounds by Keys for binding four folio prayer books, two of them richly for the altar, the other two plain. Cambridge customers outside academic circles are the hardest ones to identify because it's much less easy to find their books. When David McKittrick was analysing a Cambridge bookseller's stock in the 1630s in his History of the University Press, 
he observed that its range of popular devotional and general informational books showed that that bookseller was clearly supplying a market well beyond the university. And numerous probate inventories of early Cambridge booksellers make it clear that that was always the case. We know that books were owned in the early modern period, not only by academics and professionals and university educated people, but also by blacksmiths and merchants and yeomen and people of all kinds. And there were local gentry families with houses around Cambridgeshire who seem likely to have been sourcing some of their books here. Westow Manor, 12 miles southeast of Cambridge and belonging in the 17th century to William Baron Maynard, had a library of over 200 books in 1660, but none of them can be traced today. Families like this seem likely to have helped to sustain the higher end binding work done here. This 1629 Cambridge Bible, in a fancy contemporary Cambridge binding with four edge flaps, belonged originally to Sir John Stonehouse of Amderdon Hall in Essex before passing down his family for several generations. This handsomely bound copy of a metrical Psalter, printed in Cambridge in 1661 and bound here not long thereafter, is the kind of thing that fits this mould. In 1689, it belonged to Alethea Snelling from a Suffolk gentry family, but it's one of those all too common examples where the book's first owner hasn't left a record behind. I'm sure there are more books out there which could help us to build up this aspect of the picture once the bindings have been identified. What is the value of this knowledge? It, I said in my first lecture that I would return to ideas around research methodology and the application of what we can learn from bindings to the book historical landscape, and I think these are important questions. Most obviously, I think, when so much interest has developed, rightly, in using material evidence from books to better understand the ways in which they've been used and read and circulated, knowing when and where a book was bound is an essential part of that interpretative armoury. If we have an early book with no contemporary provenance markings, <laughs> but, uh, but we know that it was... Uh, it was bound here at more or less the time that it was printed, we have a strong indication that the book began its life here in Cambridge. Or a datable Cambridge binding on an older book tells us something about its historical trajectory. Oh, sorry. Um, the Douse Apocalypse is a much celebrated and documented, documented 13th century illuminated manuscript now in the Bodleian. But none of the many people who have written about it have observed that it is housed in a Cambridge binding made about 1580. This manuscript was clearly owned in or near Cambridge around that time, and that is surely a useful snippet of information and a hook for further research. Talking about manuscripts, uh, this research project opens up a huge field for the growing army of fragmentologists to turn their attention to the many hundreds of fragments of medieval manuscripts used in Cambridge bindings, which Neil Kerr hoped to explore in the way that he pioneered looking at this kind of thing in, in Oxford bindings, uh, but was never able to. Observing concentrations of Cambridge bindings in the libraries of particular individuals or institutions, Bury St Edmund's Grammar School, for example, whose library is now deposited here in the UL, helps us to develop our appreciation of the way the local trade here operated and its geographical reach. I was talking earlier about repair and how much evidence there is of Cambridge libraries commissioning this from local binders. I think there are many opportunities here for intellectual historians to lift some stones on questions around what was selected or not and what can be deduced about subsequent use. I have written about this elsewhere in a lecture that I gave to the Bibliographical Society a few years ago when I looked at class L star in the university library here 
Part of the stacks where the library's 16th and 17th century acquisitions are concentrated before the Royal Library, John Moore's books, came along in 1714. The books are broadly on the subject of European history and among many volumes which retain their contemporary bindings, there are also plenty which were given to Pindar in the late 17th century for rebinding or completely rebound in the 18th century. Why were some chosen and others left untouched? Is it a sign of use they had already had, calling for repair or anticipation of future use? There are obviously many variables to consider, which may make definitive answers impossible. The Pindar books may have been in flimsier bindings originally, rather than solid ones which had been read to bits, or they may have suffered damage. But we can certainly observe their condition today and see that some of the books which were rebound seem hardly to have been opened since, while others have clearly had harder lives. This late 16th century Italian imprint, a commentary on the rule of the regular canons, was rebound by Pindar about a century after it was printed for the university library. It's a very rare book. I could only find two other copies of it recorded on the JISC Discovery Hub, but the author, a contemporary prior, is so obscure that even the searching power of Google could find no references to him. That cruel judgment of posterity does seem to be borne out by the condition of the UL book, whose binding is particularly sound and whose crisp, clean pages inside suggest that it has been read very little, perhaps not at all, in the last 300 years. Close by on the shelves sits a 1521 edition of the Commentaries on Aristotle by the 6th century Byzantine philosopher John Philoponus in Greek, bound by Pindar at much the same time, whose 20th century rebacking is surely a sign of failure of the hinges, presumably through use. This copy of John Bale's 1559 edition of his Catalogue of British Authors in one of those 18th century half-calf bindings that the UL commissioned in great numbers has not stood up to the demands of readers as it now has its front board completely off. I always think that bindings can tell us useful things about books just by observing their physical condition. Many caveats to consider, but just apply common sense. Following on from that, there are lots of bindings out there, not necessarily made for libraries, which are some decades later than the imprints they cover. Here's a folio Aristotle of 1531 in a Cambridge binding made about 1580. Why was it rebound? Was it actually being bound for the first time because it had a temporary binding earlier? There are no stab stitch holes down the gutter margin, which is often a giveaway for that kind of thing having happened. Or is there some kind of owner choice going on? Often, definitive answers are elusive, but we can at least, I think, see the questions to ask. And that's another important point. What are the important questions to ask of any historic binding that's in front of us. The one which those of us who know something about bindings probably hear most often is, do you know who bound it? And there are numerous reasons why I would like to deflect our attention onto what seems to me to be more significant. You will have noticed, I hope, that I haven't framed the narrative of my lectures primarily around binders though I have mentioned them when we know about books that can be attributed to their workshops. The language there is deliberate. As I said when I was speaking about Garrett Godfrey, I'm fed up of seeing catalogue descriptions that talk about books bound by Garrett Godfrey, when the bindings were almost certainly made by hands other than his uh, in his employment. The traditional focus on binders, which has dominated so much of the literature, has consequences beyond terminological precision. It skews attention onto the tiny minority of historic bindings which can be thus attributed and towards more upmarket, way, uh, upmarket work in a way which disenfranchises most of the bindings that sit on our library shelves. 
It encourages us to think about bookbinders uh, in a William Morris or a Thomas Cobden Sanderson kind of way, which most of them were not. They did not bind books in a cocoon of creative mindfulness. <laughs> they did it in order to put bread on their tables. Uh, by extension, it tends to segregate binding studies into an art historical trench which is separate from mainstream book history. And it helps to perpetuate the model of the workings of the trade, which thinks that binderies were hermetically sealed units who didn't share workmen or tools, despite evidence to the contrary, and the fact that most of them in a place like Cambridge lived in close proximity. We don't know the precise addresses of most early Cambridge binders. Uh, as a question um, yesterday or the day before was asking about that as they're usually located in, uh, uh, located in archival documents only by their parish. Many, but not all, lived close to Great St Mary's and within its parish boundaries, but those who lived in All Saints or St Michael's would still have been within a few streets' distance in the compact town centre of Cambridge at that time. And just continuing that theme of, of artisans rather than artist craftsmen, we might observe that while the great majority of Cambridge bindings which you will see will conform to sound professional standards of construction and decoration, reflecting their years of training and experience, they are rarely perfect. The more closely you look at them, no matter whether they're simple everyday bindings or more elaborately made, the more you realise usually that the lines are not actually quite straight, the corners are not perfect, the symmetry is not precisely maintained. It's not at all unusual to find cases where tools have been used too hot and the surface of the leather has been scorched. And occasionally you come across examples when it definitely didn't quite go to plan. The centrepieces in these cases are definitely somewhat off-centre. My favourite is this one, which is now in Magdalen College here, where the upper cover has one of the common centrepieces of the 1570s applied, nothing out of the ordinary. But on the lower cover, that tool is superimposed over a clearly visible impression of another one. Presumably, a mistake was made. The other tool was wrongly applied, because almost invariably, with Cambridge as with English binding generally at this time, the front cover and the lower cover are identical. They didn't put different designs on the two covers. So uh, it was clearly a mistake, a botch, and a rather desperate attempt was made to put it right with this overstamping. The result is clearly a mess, but it was obviously considered fit for sale. I wonder whether the customer got a discount or just didn't notice or didn't care. It does conjure up visions of cross scenes in the bindery that day of an apprentice roundly clipped around the ear, but we should perhaps not speculate too far. The first question that I think we should ask of any historic binding that's in front of us is where and when approximately was it bound? And where does it sit on that spectrum of quality and cost that I'm always talking about? Then we also want to know what interventions it's had since it was first bound. Has it been repaired, changed, improved in any way? What does its condition tell us about the use of the book or the way in which it's been valued or regarded? They're all questions which it should be possible to answer, at least partially, based on the physical evidence that it presents. And their answers all contribute towards an understanding of who has owned the book and how they've used it and how they've valued it, how they've regarded it. The first of those questions, where and when was it bound, is the one which can be hardest to answer without a level of knowledge which comes primarily from observation and experience, but that is what it is all about, looking at lots of books, which can be supplemented by literature on the subject and training. Works geared to the identification of bindings have traditionally relied on the reproduction of individual tools, assuming that as they represent the impression of unique hand-engraved originals, they are not only recognisable, but also allow us to reconstruct the tool sets of particular workshops 
based on the ways in which they're grouped together over many bindings. The methodology is tried and tested and it often works, but there are caveats, not only around my bindings which are minimally decorated, it's hard to tell one blind line from another, but also around the number of tools that were in circulation at any one time, which looked very like one another and which can be very difficult to tell apart. These are not all Cambridge tools. Um, some of them are. Those of you who bought my book, you know, I can test you afterwards. Which, which are the Cambridge ones? But I won't do that. Um, uh, but, you know, the point is, you know, you've got to look very closely and carefully. It can be done, but you've got to be careful. You've got to be accurate. Many binding historians in recent decades have sought to expand these horizons beyond tools by focusing more on structures and materials as the keys to localization and dating, on the forwarding rather than the finishing. This too makes a lot of sense and needs to be part of the research armory, but also comes with, with caveats if what we are looking for is silver bullets. I have written more about this elsewhere, but in summary, my observation of Cambridge binding work is that there are no readily recognisable structural, structural fingerprints which can unfailingly be used on their own to spot a Cambridge binding at 50 paces, though there are common practices at particular periods which point strongly in that direction. At different times, there are end leaf constructions or end band colours which you see time and again in Cambridge work, but not so unfailingly as to be an infallible guide. Uh, nor do you find that Cambridge bindings of a particular period always invariably have that kind of end leaf construction. There is always uh, a, a level of, of variation. My sense is that there always was an element of vagary in the system. Depending on factors like the particular journeyman who was working on this particular book, where he was trained, which side of the bed he got out of that morning, what was on top of the waste tub that day, which supplies happened to come in from the leather sellers or the, threads, the thread merchants in the week before. Yes, you will see that most late 17th century Cambridge, ordinary grade Cambridge bindings were covered in a light to mid-brown calfskin. But every now and again, you will come across one that is in a much darker leather or a wholly unexpected grainy hide, which doesn't look as though it was intended to be a binding leather at all. Yes, late 15th century Cambridge bindings will almost always be covered in tanned calfskin, but I know of at least one example decorated with tools from the Unicorn Binder tool set bound in a scruffy and worn sheepskin. There are many anomalies across the corpus of bindings on which those Unicorn Binder tools are deployed, which make it impossible to believe, I think, that they were all bound by the same person in one workshop, which always had the same set of tools hanging up on its racks. In practice, I think all these possible methodologies need to come together within a mindset of, of empirical and evidence-based inquiry. I don't think there's any getting away from the fact that the first thing you see when you come at a book is its binding and the way it is decorated. You only have to look at any of these books from the outside to know that they were bound in Cambridge once you know what you're, look what you're looking for. This one is harder. And while I think that it too was bound here, I couldn't say that without its waste end leaves from a book printed in Cambridge in 1593 and a contemporary inscription on those waste end leaves addressed to a Cambridge bookseller. There are so many historic bindings which are very reluctant to give up their secrets and which will retain them however hard we look. But that shouldn't stop us getting as far as we can with the available evidence, pausing at the boundary between knowledge and speculation, but not being afraid to apply accurate observation to say what we can. I begin my book by saying that I am not the first person to write about Cambridge bookbinding, and I hope not to be the last. It's that second point particularly that I would want to emphasize. 
My main aim in this whole project is to encourage and enable people of all kinds of all backgrounds who handle early books as researchers, as dealers, as collectors, whatever, to recognise Cambridge work when they see it. I have not looked at every book in Cambridge, let alone elsewhere, and I don't doubt that there are more tools and distinctive features of Cambridge work that could be documented, or that deeper dives into the work of particular periods or workshops could be done. If so, and if this work helps to catalyse further investigation, well, that is the way that scholarship should work, and I will be pleased. Which brings me back to what I was saying at the beginning of my first lecture about the importance of and the ongoing need for the better integration of bookbinding observation into the standard methodologies of book historians. Everyone now pays attention to provenance and annotations in a way that such evidence was once considered inconsequential or defacement, or both. But there is still a reluctance, I think, fueled not least by a lack of training, by a lack of, of experience, of encouragement to engage with bindings. There is a small, very small, international group of dedicated binding historians who have been campaigning for years to turn this around. We all know who we are, and some of them are in this room as I speak, which is great, by trying to show how recognition and interpretation of binding evidence can contribute to our understanding of the perception and the reception and the use of books. I said at the very beginning that I would save my acknowledgements until the end. And I would first and most obviously like to thank the Sanders electors for offering me the opportunity to be Sanders reader. I am also very grateful to the University Library and the staff in and around Rare Books for accepting my proposal for this research project and for facilitating it with much support along the way. Matchek in the digital studio spent some patient days taking images of UL books, which now feature both in the book and on the online digital library. And a whole new perspective was opened up for me when Jim Bloxham and Sean Thompson from the Conservation Studio in the UL invited me to join them on their Montefiascone adventures, making models of early Cambridge bindings. But I have also spent many happy hours in Cambridge College libraries over many years, and there are too many college librarians for me to name check, but you will know who you are and you should find your names in my preface. I can't miss my partner Linda off this list of thanks whose support goes far beyond uh, her activities here as my business manager in helping to sell the books. But not least, of course, I would like to thank you, um, my audience, for listening to what I have to say. I hope it made sense and that if you weren't already enthusiasts for looking at Cambridge bindings, I hope you are now. I end as I began. These lectures are a summary or an overview of uh, a much greater wealth of information which you can find in, in the book. Uh, and my greatest wish, I think, is to find well-thumbed copies of it on library shelves uh, about 10 years from now, or, or annotated ones where people have enriched them with their own observations or notes on things that I have missed. Go forth and look for Cambridge bindings on your shelves and see what they may be able to tell you about those individual book histories. Thank you very much.